In 1990, this powerful film entitled Whose Choice was produced advocating the need to keep abortion services safe, early, and widely available for all American women. It vividly recalls the deplorable conditions which prevailed before the historic Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade, which allowed abortion on demand beginning in January 1973. This decision motivated widespread anti-abortion activities by those against choice, including the murder of some providers. Further, many state and local laws have been enacted, making safe early abortions harder to obtain, especially for poorer younger women. The original version of this film was aired on Turner Broadcasting System in prime time on September 21, 1992, just before the Clinton-Bush election that November. It was further shown on hundreds of community TV stations across the country. Then, in 2002, the film was reissued featuring a timely message at the beginning from the president of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, Rev. Carlton W. Vesey, standing in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. This second version was distributed via his affiliates all over the United States. In his statement, he deplored the continuing attacks by those who would restrict women's reproductive freedom so many years after the court decision. Now, it's 2014, over 40 years after Roe. The film you are about to see remains at its core as relevant today as when it was first made. Sadly, the war on women continues with onerous, unnecessary, and expensive impediments to abortion choice foisted on providers and women. One can only ask, how long, O oh Lord, how long does this savage bias against women go on? Hello, I'm the Reverend Carlson W. Vesey, President of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. You're about to see a powerful testament to religious support for choice, whose choice is a vivid and moving story told by clergy and people of faith, men and women who provide abortion services, the women they serve, and many other eloquent individuals. All are part of the interfaith, multiracial, multicultural, bipartisan movement for reproductive rights. There's an amazing surprise in this film. It was made 12 years ago in 1990. You may find this hard to believe. We've edited some outdated political references, but otherwise it is every bit as compelling today as it was then. So much has changed and so much has remained the same. 29 years ago, the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights was founded by clergy and religious leaders who wanted to help women obtain safe abortions. Mary Jane Patterson, a charter member of the coalition and a member of the Presbyterian Church USA, recalls that the founders believe that they were in for a 10-year struggle, at most. Today, we know the struggle is far from over. In fact, it has intensified, and the stakes are growing. We are one Supreme Court of vote away from returning to the time of illegal, unsafe, back-alley abortion. Just one vote. Much has changed. Whose choice? was made before the murders of Dr. David Gunn, Jim Barrett, Dr. John Britton, Leanne Nichols, Shannon Lawney, Dr. Wayne Patterson, and Dr. Barnett Slepian. It was made before our car became the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, before partial birth abortion entered the anti-choice lexicon, before RU 486 was finally approved, before hospital reproductive services were slashed, before the clinic violence was recognized for what it truly is, domestic terrorism. Much remains the same. Religious extremism, the debasement of women, the ceaseless legislation, much of it unconstitutional, and playing politics with a complex decision. On the positive side, much also remains the same. And this is very striking. The courage of providers and women, the determination to follow their conscience and live out their faith, the struggle to prevent unintended pregnancy, the constancy of coalition member organizations, clergy and affiliates, the theological and spiritual foundations of our commitment to women's choice, and above all, our profound reverence for life. I know you join me in paying tribute to the filmmakers Don Collins and Winfield Best for their vision, whose choice remains the ultimate question before us. Thank you very much. Women everywhere are at risk. Their right to determine their own reproductive freedom has been challenged. 
Today, once again, the choice confronts us. I'm Sarah Weddington. I'm a teacher and a lawyer. In 1973, I had the extraordinary experience of winning the case of Roe versus Wade before the US Supreme Court. That decision legalized abortion in this country. Now that decision is in grave danger, and all of us must work to win once again the principle that abortion is not a decision for the government to make. So what is the essential issue in all of this? Well, Jody, it's an issue that's both simple and complex, because the real issue is who is going to make the decision of whether a woman can have a safe legal abortion? Is it going to be that woman in her own good conscience, or is it going to be some branch of the government? Shouldn't we trust that woman with whatever guidance she may seek to make the best decision? You see people in towns and cities, in homes and churches all over America are getting together just like this, getting together to talk and to work to try to be sure that abortion does remain safe and legal. The threat to abortion rights reaches into every community in all 50 states. There are substantially fewer abortion providers nationwide than there were just a few years ago. Some women travel more than a thousand miles to visit Dr. James Armstrong's family practice in Kalispell, Montana. Many patients for whom we do abortions have come to me for their continued care and one of the nicest things about it has been uh, the women who, for whom I've done abortions in the past have come back to me uh, to be their doctor when they're having a baby and, and that's been an extremely satisfying thing. It's not right for any outsider, the government, church, or doctor even, to make decisions about abortion for somebody else. We counsel every woman or couple coming in for an abortion and when it comes down to it, the ultimate decision must be theirs. I've worked with Dr. Armstrong doing abortions for 13 years and I feel very good about what I do. The most important thing that we do in our office when we counsel women who are here for abortions is to find out their feelings about it. If they're clear about that this is what they need and want to do right now in their lives. I would have found any way to have an abortion and I'm just... I'm outraged myself that people would try to tell me what to do with an issue as private as this and as important to this, and, and I can't imagine any other woman would feel any different about that. I, uh, I'm just very grateful that this was available to me, and it better be available for my daughter and all those to come. I perform abortions because of my religious belief. I would feel... I wasn't living up to my Christian responsibility if I saw the need and did not offer an answer to that need. We have a saying among Presbyterians that God alone is Lord of the conscience. I love this park. It gives me a perspective to come up here and get refreshed after my work. I think about the struggles that we have in providing abortion. Think back to my medical school days in New York City when 20 to 30 women a day would come into our city hospital clinic bleeding, infected and dying and from having illegal abortions and from trying to induce an abortion themselves. And to think what it would be if the law were changed so that abortions were illegal again that I'd be a criminal for doing abortions. It's terrible to think that that would be imposed on women again in our society, a country that we think of, of freedom of belief, freedom of religion. Right-wing fundamentalists have created the false impression that to be religious means to be anti-choice. But in fact, religious support for abortion rights has a long and honored tradition. 
reaffirmed today by leaders such as Methodist minister Ignacio Castuera. How many times the words of our women in society have gone over our head or around us, but they really have not come to our heart. And we have not taken seriously the threat that keeps on coming when freedom of choice is being taken away from one of our groups. If one of our groups in society is deprived of choice, sooner or later all of us will be deprived of choice. We are concerned about it seems to me that complete here. life, interactive life, life as a net network of relationships and not simply life as a potential life or or in utero life or things of that nature. I think that the Bible quite clearly recognizes the differences between potential life before birth and actual life after birth so that we as United Methodists would be far more interested in protecting the health and well-being, in fact the life of women on the abortion issues. It's very important for Christians, particularly the mainline Protestant groups, to understand the theology and to not accept when um, the anti-choice groups come up with bits and pieces of scripture here and there and they put them together and they say, ah, here's our scriptural basis and foundation. There is nothing in the Bible that is prohibitive against abortion. There's a wonderful psychologist within our congregation who has a number of aphorisms, one of which is, make haste slowly. I ask people to go very slowly through the process of making the decision as to whether or abort or not. But certainly, from my point of view, from the Reformed Jewish community's point of view, there is an adequate amount of, of religious backing for e any decision which the woman ultimately makes, as long as it is a decision with which she can live for the rest of her life. All life is sacred, but it is the woman who is the moral agent in making that decision whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. We have said uh, as clearly as we know how to say that it is uh, morally repugnant to force an unwanted child uh, on an unwilling mother. I've been here 23 years and I've seen lots of people who've come into this room to share the deepest anguish and the deep trauma of making a choice to protect their own emotional health, to give them a chance to, to have a new kind of future. They, they wanted to terminate that pregnancy and they wanted to feel that they could be God's person in that act. And I've said to them as a priest of the church, that God has given you that freedom to choose and that after you have prayed about it and, and wrestled with it, if that is your decision, that's a holy act and the church is there to be a companion with you in that decision. Of the 35 Jewish, Protestant and other faith groups that make up the religious coalition for abortion rights, all agree on two moral concepts. One is that they support religious liberty. Number two, all agree that women are moral thinking human beings that make wise decisions. Increasingly, support for abortion rights has come from Catholics who may be devoted to their church, but are directly opposed to the bishop's anti-abortion stand. Professor Daniel McGuire is a distinguished Catholic theologian who teaches at Marquette University. In some ways, the current pope is the Ronald Reagan of the modern papacy. You would think under this pope that Catholicism was a right-wing organization very much fixated on the pelvic issues of contraception, sexuality, homosexuality, and abortion, and that simply is an insult to the tradition itself. 
I decided that we had to speak to Catholic women and to other women about abortion since most of the theology of abortion in Christianity was written by the inseminators, not by the bearers. Now even Archbishop Weakland of Milwaukee has started to do the same thing. I think Archbishop Weakland realizes what the other bishops ought to realize, that he's losing women and the church is losing women on this issue. And when you lose women, they take their children with them and you've said goodbye to the next generation. This is just um, a glorious stage in Catholic politics in the United States and reminds me of, you know, in, indeed the lead that uh, President Kennedy showed um, in the 60s when he met with those ministers in Texas and said, the church does not speak for me on, uh, on politics, in essence, and I do not speak for the church either in politics or in religion. The founding fathers of this country were, were most interested in separation of church and state because they had faced public violence in their own countries over religious wars. And I think what is now so clear is that the abortion issue presents us with that kind of religious war, that kind of, of political hatred and turmoil that needs to be avoided and that separation of church and state was created to protect us against. The first Saturday that we were open, we had protesters on the property up at the front door talking to the women, screaming at them, screaming things like, God is going to sit in judgment of you and let us help you. Don't kill your baby. I went up to this group of free men and I said, I'm the director of the clinic. This is private property. You'll have to leave. And one of them turned to me and said, do you want to live or die? And it's just a real feeling of invasion. It's a real, it's a real, um, it makes you feel powerless. None of us is for abortion, certainly not as a primary method of birth control. What we are for is access to abortion services as part of a larger strategy on family planning. What we shouldn't be doing is trying to force women to go through pregnancies regardless of their circumstances. And what we should be doing is trying to see that there are fewer unwanted pregnancies. This is not just an issue of abortion. This is an issue that relates to the entire area of fertility control. Um, the, the Catholic bishops and much of the secular anti-choice movement um, care very little about just the abortion question. Their goal in the long term and their goal historically has been to prevent um, access, to block access to all methods of contraception so that in fighting for legal abortion, we indeed are also conducting um, the first defense against a future attack on contraception. Although we are passionately pro-choice, we are also equally passionate in creating the kind of society in which abortion is less and less a necessary option. So we, that's why that linkage of safe legal abortion and better contraception goes together. I was given a, a quotation by Harry Emerson Fosdick some 20 years ago when he was the minister at Riverside Church in New York City. He said, reverence for life from this principle flows the birthright of every new infant to be a wanted child born into a warm and loving home. And I think that we've tried to say that's what choice is about. When I think about my daughter's life experience and the quality of life that I wanted for her and that I want for her, um, it is important to me to participate in creating a world that allows her to have as much freedom as possible. When I think of the fact that um, at age 12, I was sexually abused, I became pregnant and had an illegal abortion. I uh, was raised Catholic and there was a lot of information that as a 12 year old I had to carry. The whole experience um, between the age of 12 and 17, I thought that I was totally damaged goods. Um, my reproductive health organs were traumatized by the abortion. 
I was later determined sterile, and my daughter is adopted, so that's how I explain that. Um, but I carried around for a long time that experience, and I carried forever the fact that I could never have children. That was not going to be my daughter's experience if I had anything at all to do with it. I thought the Supreme Court decided this issue once. Isn't there something wrong with our system that we have to fight for abortion rights all over again? It's a good question, Jason. But you've all heard that remark of Thomas Jefferson when he said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, and we're living that. Almost every generation has to be part of reaffirming basic rights, like the right of privacy and separation of church and state. Ultimately, the issues are never really decided by the courts alone. It's a political process in the grandest sense, a choice of the people. If a woman's right to choose is going to be protected in the 90s and into the next century, it's going to have to be protected by politicians, by the kind of people we elect to state legislatures and, and city councils. And I think, for better or worse, the future has to be in organizing uh, for the political process. I think it's going to have to start with people gathering their friends and neighbors in their living rooms and, and talking about this issue and asking each other what they can do to elect the kind of people that um, that understand the importance of this place and the lives of women in this country. The growing pro-choice coalition is multicultural and multiracial, as well as bipartisan. I think it's an interesting phenomena that people are recognizing that there is a difference in the pro-choice movement today with more people of color, especially more women of color, being involved. And it's not just women, because our concern is communities of color. Therefore, we're talking about the men and the women, because pro-choice and reproductive health are not just women's issues. They're issues for our men, they're issues for our children, and they're issues for our male children growing up. You know, responsible parenting is really important. As part of the surge of support for abortion rights, SOS, Students Organizing Students, recently sponsored a mother and daughter fundraiser and strategy meeting in Beverly Hills. I found students like myself who were raised to believe that reproductive freedom was a fundamental right, not a privilege. I found an educational system that is not teaching the students in the colleges today that that is in danger. People my age, I think, are very surprised about the Webster decision. I, I don't think they ever thought that they'd have to ever deal with this. I mean, I'm 22 years old, and as, as, from far, as far back as I can remember, abortion has been legal, and it's been safe and legal. And I think people my age are really shocked. Many of my friends had illegal abortions. Uh, one died. Two of them can no longer have children. They, because of the illegal abortions, they were unable to, to uh, conceive and have a child. Uh, it was a very traumatic, uh, difficult time for all women. And women will always find or try to find a means to have an abortion for an unwanted pregnancy, whether it's legal or not legal. And we to women everywhere, all over the world, Romania, everywhere, the right to decide what happens with their body. And it has to be safe and it has to be legal. Can I kiss her? <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's, a, it's an issue of how you feel about government interference. Um, we had the situation in Romania where women were being forced to bear children against their will where their menstrual cycles were being monitored by the government. It's the government making the decision and obviously the government's decision can go either way. So to me the overriding concern is who owns a woman's body because if you don't own your own body you are a slave. It's crucial that she have the right to make decisions about her own body. Um, it just couldn't be anything more important, and I, I think it's, it's uh, up to every parent to, to ensure that their kids have the freedoms that they, they feel they have a right to.
liberty of religious conscience, to the right to privacy, and to reproductive freedom and health. anything at all to do with it. 